Greetings and sow. Utations, everyone. It is I, the infamous, penniless captain of chaos himself, Patrick Ferguson. Howdy, howdy, howdy. And welcome to uh, another Captain's Cast. A simple podcast about a simple man talking about Mahovies, or as you, the public, might call them, movies. <laughs> Gross, little, crawling, insectoids, insects. We know them as bugs. And it is universally agreed that they're grody. <laughs> now, of course, there are some people who uh, are fascinated by these little creatures on our big blue and green planet. And uh, they'll give you a good argument that these uh, bugs are viable, they're smart, admirable even. Something to uh, look at and study and be fascinated by. Then there's the rest of humanity, including your host with the most here, Patrick Ferguson, that says most of them belong under my boot. But say what you will, everyone can basically agree if they were the size of us. That might just be goddamn terrifying. Hell, the 50s and even some of the 60s, there was a whole goddamn subgenre about the giant bugs uh, to invade our planet, to try to take over you know, what humanity has built. Crumble it to the ground, says the 50s monster movies. Well, it's not just the 50s that shook out a little bug magic. But there was a period in the late 90s and the early 2000s where we just couldn't get enough of our bug creatures, uh, from our Men in Blacks to uh, the Relic, to the exact topic of today, and that is not just the first one, but all three of the Mimic movies. I uh, just did the little intro there and I had to pause for a sec. Because the old hunger kicks in, and I'm having a pretty nice salad. Pretty big, sizable salad. And it just reminded me, I thought I'd share this. Uh, I did a post the other day on Facebook about a veggie sandwich that I ordered from Jimmy John's. Fucking fantastic. Why well, I make a post, and I take a picture... And <laughs> it, it kind of cracked me up because everyone like, oh, I don't know, 40 and over. Like I got a lot of comments of, ooh, gross. Where's the meat? Oh, no. Did they mess up your order? <laughs> and they just, it's like they didn't get it. It's like, no, fuckers. I chose to order a meatless sandwich. <laughs> And the concept was terrifying to him. Now, everyone 40 and under, you know, my age or, uh, or younger was like, oh, that, that's the tits, sir. Hell yes. A veggie sub sounds awesome. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the, uh, the semi elderly did not understand, you know, where's the meat? Where's the beef? Says the eighties. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just had to share that. We're already off topic. I did the intro and now it's off to La La Land. But uh, yeah, I uh, thought I'd share. Now I did and now on with the farce. <laughs> so, Mimic, 1997. Now, before we even get into uh, what this film is about, let's talk about who made this film. It is the one, it is the only, uh, monster lover himself, god of creature features, Guillermo del Toro. <laughs> yes. Yes. Now, there are some people who think Guillermo, 
uh, can do no wrong. And everything he touches is gold. I'm not quite there. I do think he has flaws in his films. I think the story usually takes a back seat to the more creative and theatrical elements. Now, that being said, I think, oh, I don't know, 80% of the time it works. That's pretty high, you know what I mean? This is a, a, a more than just good filmmaker, folks. If you've been living under a rock, this is the director of Hellboy and Shape of Water, um, Pan's Labyrinth, um, a slew of great little uh, TV spots and short films. Uh, he just really hit it out of the fucking park with uh, his version of Pinocchio. That was just last year. It was strange. Last year we had a lot of Pinocchio movies for whatever reason, but Guillermo, of course, is the cream of the crop, the uh, king of the hill. God damn it, Bobby. And uh, most things, most things he does are phenomenal. Most are. Now, you let him do what he wants, you usually get something pretty fantastic. Now, you make Mimic 1997 <sighs> through the Weinstein Company. Yep. I'm going to not talk too directly about those monsters, but yeah. If there are flaws with this film, it is mainly, I'd say, from uh, the producers. It is from the Weinstein Company. They were so up the ass of poor Guillermo. Um, where Guillermo wanted to tell a story with uh, some biblical references and kind of an overall arc of, hey, mankind has had its time on Earth. Now, it's time for something else. The Weinsteins wanted the monsters. Oh, spooky monsters scare me. <laughs> uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, there's nothing wrong with just a big dumb monster flick. But Guillermo del Toro has never... If you love him, if you hate him, whatever your thoughts on Guillermo del Toro movies, he has never made just a big, dumb monster movie. There was always something more to it. Even the, like, Pacific Rim stuff, which I think is a little on the weaker uh, side of his film career, I would still watch, you know, over, like, uh, you know, the Godzilla remake from the 90s, or the stupid Doom movie, or, you know what I mean? There's plenty of monster movies that I would pass on for even, like, a weaker Del Toro flick. But, that being said, what we get is still pretty interesting, uh, despite the Weinstein meddling. Uh, Mimic, right off the bat, I fell in love with the color palettes. Because it's grim, it's dark, it's gritty. Um, it reminds me uh, a lot of Seven. It has a similar palette. Not exactly the same, but similar. And through the style and lighting alone, I could already be reminded of things that would come later for uh, Mr. Guillermo. Uh, especially Hellboy. Like, just the look of this. Like, I feel like you could watch Mimic and Hellboy after, and you could kind of even maybe in your own head say, these could be in the same universe, just by the look alone. You know, seamless. You know, like a, a graphic novel or something. Just could pin them together nicely. I would also say, if you like the kind of look and feel of the Batman, then this film would be for you. Um, I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just lovely to look at, you know, it's like looking through a rusty green bottle you found at your local garbage site. <laughs> if that sounds like it would be your shit, then this film just might be for you.
So, the basic story of Mimic. Uh, we have Dr. Susan Tyler uh, and her soon-to-be husband, I think a fellow uh, doctor himself, and they are dealing with a pretty disgusting epidemic uh, that infects mainly children. And there's this beautiful opening where it's very stylistic and kind of gothic and... Uh, the hospital looks nothing like a hospital, but very exaggerated and much more uh, artsy. And it's pretty goddamn great. Um, it almost gave me a little bit of a Burton vibe, which is like Burton and Del Toro. It's, why not? Um, God, can you imagine if Del Toro and Tim Burton did something together? Ponder that, fuckers. So this opening with all these sick kids in this kind of... Uh, you know, uh, makeshift uh, gothic hospital, and come to find out that it uh, it's being spread or being yeah being carried by cockroaches, and they're infesting the city of the Big Apple itself, New York, New York. So uh, this doctor here, our lead, right? Miss Tyler. Her and her soon-to-be hubby create their own bug through uh, genetic manipulation, and it is called the Judas breed. And right away we get our biblical references. You know what I mean? Uh, for those of you who don't know, Judas is a character from the Bible, and he was like uh, Jesus' BFF. And he totally stabbed that mofo in the back. And that's how Jesus ended up on the big plank of wood. And round and round we go. Uh, so yeah, it's not a name that you go out of your way uh, to name something unless there is meaning and intent. Um, and of course the intent here for the film is to tell you, you know, hey, Judas... Red flag, right here. Bad bug. This bug is created, and it's going to go around into the cockroach population of New York. And it's going to kill off the cockroaches. So that's what they do. Kids stop dying. Everybody's celebrating like it's 1997 in this case. And a couple years go by. Things are good. Um, the uh, lead doc has married her, you know, her her boyfriend doc. You know, doc, doc, goose. They're living the high life. Ritzy clothes, good big size apartment. I mean, uh, they've got it good. And then... Some little hoodlums, <laughs> some little troublemakers, who uh, remind me of some of my friends, actually. Uh, these kids, they run up, and uh, apparently they give the doc some bug samples every now and again. And, you know, she kicks them five bucks or something, they bring her a moth or a, a cricket, a spider, whatever. Well, this time they got something big, something real big, and they think it's a butterfly. Uh... They've trapped it in a cereal box, and they're, they're, they're goddamn saying, hey, this is good. This is going to be real good. You got to buy this, chief. You got to buy this. So she gives them a tent, and uh, little hoodlums run off, <laughs> little rascal pirates. <laughs> and she pulls what, what is certainly not... A butterfly, not a moth, nothing of that sort. And it bites the shit out of her. It stings her. Maybe that was it. It stings the shit out of her. And she sees some, some red flags. She's like, wait a minute. Hold on now, chief. This can't be the bug her and her hubby released a couple years ago because they put genetics of like a suicidal timer to where the bugs can't live past 90 days. And this is a couple years later. This can't be it. No way, no how well it is, motherfucker. It is. Uh, it is the Judas breed. And then the investigation kind of takes off of, hey, 
why are these alive? They seem stronger than ever. And we must investigate the New York sewers and take care of the problem. Well, homeless people are missing. Weird, uh, lengthy men in dark hats and dark trench coats have been seen, you know, wandering around. Here's, there's a mystery here. There's a question mark, if you will. Now, eventually we meet a uh, cast of colorful characters that range from kind of quirky to kind of just there. Um, the one I got to talk about, the one that's going to probably piss you off the most is the little boy who's probably on the spectrum. I forget if he's like ADHD, like myself, or autistic or something. You know, not all there. Uh, but they set this kid up. They set this kid up like he's really going to do something. Like he's going to have a lot to bring to the table. Like, don't, you know, don't let uh, his disability fool you, right? Don't judge a book by its cover. This little offbeat, strange kid... He's got something to offer to this film. Surely, this child will do something in the movie. Surely. Because I think his name is Chewy. I'm almost certain of it. His uh, father is played by a really cool Italian actor I've always enjoyed, who played, uh, uh, was it Officer Patsy from uh, Hannibal? Bows in, bows out. But the kid, his little baby boy, uh, not a baby, maybe like 10 years old tops, um, Chewy is uh, the, the son of a, sh a shoe shiner. Got a lot of shushes right there. Sorry about the shushing. I'll try to shush the shushing for you all. Shh. <laughs> Little Chewie has an ability to where he can imitate footsteps like clicks. You know, you're walking along and he can mimic it perfectly. Now, if that sounds kind of lame, well, yeah, yeah, it is. But they make a big deal out of it. They really set this up to let you know, hey, this kid can uh, interpret or, or duplicate uh, sounds. And he has a weird thing with shoes, too, where he's always uh, referencing how big someone's shoe is. Oh, ten and a half, nine and a half, eight and a half left, uh, nine foot, you know, on the right. Um, like, he has this thing, okay? And... Uh, it comes into play, but it doesn't serve anything. Like, that that part of, of his tics, or his strangeness, comes into play where he's realized, you know, these shoes are off. This doesn't make sense when he sees one of those strange men, the tall, thin men in the black uh, fedora hat and the black trench coat. And to the point where he sees that thing around, you know, just like outside his his window or d down on the street curb or, you know, near a lamplight. And he always goes, oh, Mr. Funny Shoes, Mr. Funny Shoes. So they set up this, this little autistic or little on-the-spectrum child. Like, okay, he's got these tics. He's got these problems that would otherwise, you know, uh, be kind of a burden. But in this film... Just you wait, just you fucking wait. He's going to use his quirks, his weirdness, right? And he's going to solve a problem or save the day or something like that. Well, I tell you this from the bottom of my hearts of hearts. Wrong! <laughs> it literally never comes up. If anything... His fuckery actually gets a character very close to him killed. Like, 
This bothered me so much. If you want to do the gifted child thing, go ahead. It can work. A sixth sense, right? I see dead people and such. Okay? It can work. But I don't know. I've looked into this a little bit, but I don't have the answers here. If this kid was going to save the day and have a good arc, if Chewie was going to turn out to actually be useful in the film instead of just, oh, he's in danger, let's go save him. Oh, people get killed. You have anything to offer? Uh, nine and a half. Nope, nothing. All right. Like, damn it. You know, I don't know if this was the Weinsteins getting involved or if this was just something not very fleshed out by Guillermo. Now, I do believe he wrote most of this script. But I think it was the Weinsteins who said, hey, you got to have a, a co-writer to kind of flesh out the structure a bit. So it might have been two writers. So maybe this is not Guillermo's fault. But damn, is, is it an oversight? Because he just ends up being fucking useless, man. You know? I wanted to see him overcome and do something. They, they felt like they were building up his character, and then they just fucking drop it. Okay. That's mainly the only negative shit I have to say about this film. Moving on! I will mention that Mimic... I don't know to what extent, but is based on a short story by someone. Uh, their name escapes me at the moment. Um, but I don't know if it's widely known. I don't know if this is like a classic. You know, a true sci-fi, brilliant fucking classic, or if this was just kind of, eh, some people know about it, some people don't. Um, but it is based on a short story, and I thought I'd let you know. One of my absolute favorite things about this movie, besides the cinematography and the lighting, is certainly the music. Uh, I'm not sure who did it. At times it feels a little Danny Elfman, um, but at other times it felt like John Williams. So, I mean, that's, I would say that's high praise for anyone. So if it's not one of those two gentlemen, then... Uh, Whoever did this, I mean, they, they knew what they were doing. Because it's so magical. And it takes you into uh, kind of that, you know, greasy green bottle, but with a little bit of a fairy tale oomph to it. And, uh, you know, if I found my eyes drifting or something like that, because there, there were some small moments in the film where I was like, all right, let's, let's kind of get to it. Uh, the music would suck me back in to where I'm like, all right, I'm in this world and I'm embracing this. So, fantastic music, absolutely. Let's discuss the cast for a moment because there's some fun names in here. Um, hell, there's even a cameo from a very young Norman Reedus. Reedus? I forget how you say his name. Reedus? Norman Reedus uh, from The Walking Dead. And it was funny to see him pop up because uh, you can just kind of feel his energy when he's on screen. You know, I'm not surprised he went on to be such a star in Walking Dead. Um, but you got Josh Brolin. You got Charles S. Dutton. Um, you got uh, F. Murray Abram, who would be, I think, kind of a regular with Del Toro. Right? I think he's uh, one, of the, uh, one of my favorite villains. From the show The Strain, which is, you know, maybe underrated. That, that's a fantastic show. Um, but, I mean, the list, I guess, kind of goes on. I'm, I'm going to go look right now, actually. Um, oh, of course, Doug Jones is somewhere in there. I'm not sure who he was. He might have been one of the uh, tall uh, gentlemen in the hat and coats. Very possibly. Um, but this is a really, really good cast. Uh, everyone, you know, kind of works off of each other well. And even the characters who are just kind of there, um, I feel like the actors and actresses around them heighten them to some level, you know? Like, 
really solid cast, you know, early 90s, so there's a lot of faces you will probably recognize. Now, from what I know, Mimic was supposed to have a much darker ending, really play on the themes of mankind has had its chance and now it's time for something else. Uh, but it doesn't end that way. It ends much more upbeat. Um, I will mention I did not watch the theatrical, which is the Harvey uh, Weinstein and Bob Weinstein cut. That's how they wanted the film to go. Um, but I watched, and it's pretty easy to get a hold of, luckily. Uh, you can find it in most places. Like, it's the definitive version. If you're gonna watch Mimic, you watch uh, the director's cut. Um, I think it was 2000... Oh, I, I know I heard this somewhere. It must have been early two, 2012, 2014, somewhere in there. Uh, Del Toro actually got to go back and do a director's cut. Like, uh, when uh, the Weinsteins were out of control for Mimic, when, you know, their, their time has had passed, um, the new owners said, hey, Del Toro, do you want, you know, a definitive cut of this? And he said, hell yes, I do. And uh, that's the one I watched. It's a little longer. Uh, it's like an hour and 40-something minutes, something like that. Um, and you feel that a little bit, but the story in comparison is much more fleshed out and everything looks appropriate in the theatrical. From what I remember, there were shots that really felt like inserts, like the coloring was all off and it, it felt rushed and it was just kind of like, I'd turn my head and go, huh, that was weird those color palettes and that cinematography did not fit any of the other movie in the director's cut everything blends everything gels everything has that dark you know seven uh the batman kind of feel uh pre of course uh batman i guess or the batman and uh i would say that's probably the version you should watch you know I mean, unless you want to go out of your way and just say, I want a stupid monster movie, then maybe the theatrical is for you. But if you want something with a little more of an auteur um, to your drink, as it were, I would say, watch the directors. Cut! The grossness. The grossness of this film is either going to make it or break it for you, I think. Uh, because as much as I have said, not a lot, lot negative about the film, except for the, you know, going fucking nowhere arc of Chewie, uh, this film is gross, man. This film is gross. I made the mistake of eating while watching Mimic. And like within the first 10 minutes or less even, you see this giant infestation of real cockroaches. And I'm sitting there, you know, eating baked tofu. So, <laughs> not, not, not a great mixture, Chieftain. Not a great mixture. <laughs> so, I mean, you really have to be okay with gross. And I don't mean gore. Actually, there's very little gore. Really, almost no gore, I guess. Really, there's only blood, you know? Like, on that level, it's very, very tame. But as far as, like, insects and their insides and gross and egg sacs and... As far as that goes, this has a whole lot of gross. And for me, as much as I love this, because it's a fantastic little piece... It takes it back for me, because I just don't enjoy seeing a lot of gross. Some people do, you know? Some people do. Some people are okay with, like, uh, what's a great example? Oh, uh, Peter Jackson's bad taste, you know? Some people like gross. Uh, not so much me. I can watch gross. I can handle it, but... It's not something I'd go out of my way to, to seek 
You know, it's it's not something I get really enjoyment out of. Uh, you know, gore and slashing and blood and guts and stuff. As far as like practical effects and such go, I really do seek that. I like that. I like gore. I like blood. You know, uh, like the insides. But as far as just flat out, look at these bugs. Look how gross we can be. Look at these feelers. You know, you know, fucking egg sacs and such. Not something I'm <laughs> too psyched out about, Chief. Not at all. So, this is not a five tiny top hats. And I would struggle to give it four. Because I've seen better Del Toro flicks. There are many. You know? Like I said, I think Hellboy would only be a couple years after this. And I think that is... That's probably much closer to a five tiny top hats. That's pretty solid for me. But as far as this story, uh, which is told well with these characters and this, this very, you know, dark, dank greens and yellows, you know, stylistic setting, as much as I respect it, uh, I respect it more than I like it. If that makes any sense. I think this is a good film, you know? I think it had the potential to be great, but the Weinsteins, you know, fucked around too much. About a lot, actually, the more you read about them. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Um, and what we got is a good film. I don't think it's great, though. This might be where I do a halfer, right? Three tiny top hats is good. But the way this film shot, the way the music kicks in, the uh, um, the kind of you know biblical undertones, I think that raises it up a bit. So let's give this mimic 1997, a little underrated Guillermo del Toro classic, a three tiny top hats and a half out of five. Mimic 2, 2001, <coughs> uh, Del Toro did not come back, um, to the series, uh, the two movies that follow are from completely different directors, um, my speculation would be is because Del Toro already made a name for himself by the time they wanted to do sequels, and it was, uh, it was just probably going to be a no from him, I imagine. Um, I've heard Del Toro famously say that his experience in the meddling of the Weinsteins for Mimic One was so bad that it was his worst moment in his life. Now, this is a man who has had his father kidnapped and held for ransom. At one point, not that, but the making of Mimic One was his worst moment in life. So <laughs> I'm pretty sure if they did even have a, a script he liked and they offered him an appropriate amount of money, he'd still say, fuck no, fuck no. Now this film was probably the one they played the most on the sci-fi channel when I was, like, a teenager, probably. Uh, so this is the one that I had the most knowledge about. Because um, I saw Mimic 1 when I was a kid, and I had fun with it. You know, again, maybe a little too gross, but I had fun with it. Uh, but Mimic 2 was always being played on the Sci-Fi Channel. This is the one I had the most memory of. Um, we are introduced to a new bug lady named Remy, who, until this most re recent watch, because what I did is the other night literally watch all three back-to-back. -back. You know, I was aware of the first two. I don't think until now I saw three. That was a new experience, but I watched them all back-to-back, and yeah, 2 was the one I remember the most seeing on as a kid. And I would pay, like, half attention. You know, I was always doing shit. 
You know, I was talking on the phone to my girlfriend, or me and my bandmates were hanging out, but in the background, there's a good chance Mimic 2 was on the Sci-Fi Channel, somewhere in the room. Now our lead, Remy, is another bug lady like the first one, so my initial memory was it was the same character. For whatever reason, without the husband, on her own, life's kind of gone down a will. But that's not the case. On this most uh, recent watch, I found out, oh, this is just a different character, who I think, if memory serves, I think she had a brief cameo in the first Mimic. She was just a weird side character that would uh, have this weird quirk of when she had a bad date with someone, she'd take a picture of herself to remember and maybe relish the pain or learn from it, or I don't know. She would take pictures of herself after horrible moments, uh, dates being some of these moments. Uh, well, now that's, that's completely fleshed out, this is our main character, and you know what, folks? She is far more interesting than our leads in the last film. Now, I know there's some of you who are going to be like, oh, he said something was better than the Del Toro one. Fuck him. Come on, everyone. Let's go. We're going to fuck him to death. <laughs> yeah. But I am serious. Remy is more interesting. She's kind of this quirky but kind of broken strange character who's very smart in one way in uh, the study of bugs right um who uh is a teacher i believe i'm remembering that right she's a teacher at you know uh a very inner city type school i think this is still new york uh and it's you know it's fallen apart the building itself is a husk i mean it barely looks like school even um but she's very smart in one ways, but then very crippled in other ways, you know, emotionally and then trying to connect with people. And certainly in the love life section, it's just a what you would call a no go. So off the bat, I'm intrigued. I'm curious where this new main antagonist uh, is going to go. I'm curious what her arc's going to be. Um, and, uh, the rest of the characters, the slew that we get, maybe not as strong as the first one, but they mostly work. You know, the, the, the kid actors um, are not terrible. Uh, if anything, our lead has a moment or two where her acting is kind of like, I don't know, maybe she was walking through the scene or having a bad day. But for the most part, she holds her own. Uh, I do like Remy as a character. I'll also mention that the look of this film is very, very close to Del Toro's first film. I'm happy to say, watching these three films back to back, um, you can tell the two other directors in the franchise looked at Mimic 1 and said, okay, we gotta keep that style, we gotta play with lighting in the same way, and uh, that's nice because you can watch these three movies back to back, and it all blends very well. It all works. Uh, you have no problem believing, stylistically, this is all the same universe. So, our main story here is uh, our lead Remy, this bug lady of sorts, this teacher in an inner city type scenario. Um, she keeps finding that... Uh, Guys who are close to her in any fashion keep getting whacked off. Not in that sense, you rascal degenerates. <laughs> but in the sense of they get killed. They get uh, murdered. Pretty brutally. Um, that, that's another thing maybe to, to mention is this uh, has a little more gore in it than the last one. The last one, it's more creature stuff. This is a little more gore. Um, yeah, any male that's close to her is getting murdered. And, uh, 
you know, there's a detective on the case, and there's a there's another mystery to be solved, and the man, well, I use man that term very lightly here, but the uh, let's say thing <laughs> in the dark hat and dark coat is back. We're starting to see it again, so you know from the first one. Okay, it is spoilers. Spoilers, everyone, you fuckers. We're like 40 minutes in, so you're fine. You're all right. Uh, we know that the man in the dark clothes is actually one of the full-grown, like, full-adult uh, Judas breeds. You know, they're, they're fucking gigantic, but they can blend in just well enough. They do have that hunter blend in strategy you know uh as humans being really their only pr uh enemy i guess you know um everything else is prey but humans actually cause a threat so being very intelligent they try to it's in the title mimic us you know dress like us just enough to kind of walk around in the shadows and be fine so, Mr. Silly Shoes, or whatever the hell he was called in that first one, uh, is walking around again, and come to find out that this thing is fixated on our lead. Fucking fixated. To the point where it's killing the guys around her, but it's not just killing them. There's a little more to it. It is finally doing what I thought was going to happen in the first one with, you know, again, the mimic title on the nose, what have you. It's actually killing these guys and ripping their faces off. And the reason being is it is trying to uh, go to the next level and actually not just, oh, it kind of looks like a human shape from a distance. No, really trying to simulate flesh and hair, and human facial features. So it can get close to Remy, not to kill her, but this thing wants something even worse than death. It wants to mate. So, being the last of the full adult Judas breeds, this thing keeps killing in its pursuit for Remy's fine, fine ass sets. And it eventually leads Remy and a couple of her favorite students to be stuck, to be trapped inside. One of my favorite set pieces is the school, because that thing was so run down and, you know, barely resembled a school anyway, more of a brick kind of uh, decrepit building, something you would see in, like, one of the rec movies, um, or maybe even Resident Evil or something of that genre. Uh, they get trapped in there, her and a few students, and that's when the murder and the shenanigans ensue. If you watch Mimic 1 and Mimic 2 and 3 and whatnot, and you say, you know, I think Mimic 2 was kind of a by-the-numbers monster kind of slasher flick. Very popcorn. Really easier to digest than the first one. Every pun intended. Uh, you'd be correct. Now, as far as preference goes, I'm gonna break some hearts here, but I was more invested in this story than I was the first one. Don't get me wrong, all the biblical undertones and the, uh, you know, somewhat nihilistic uh, ways of the first one, I think are awesome. But again, it's not something I can eat a meal to or even look at the screen the whole time because bugs squirming around and fucking, you know, bug guts and goo and gross and glop. That's just not my favorite thing. And this movie, Mimic 2, while still keeping the stylistic tones of the first one, maybe not, you know, the music's not as good, I'll give it that. Mimic 2 
puts the gross bug stuff on the back burner. And in the forefront is more of a horror story, more of a gory, you know, scary horror film. And as far as preference goes, fuckers, I enjoy that better. Oh, I know. I hear the booze. I hear them echoing in my skull, radiating out my nostrils. But I mean it, you know? I'm less of uh, I want to see gross stuff and more of I want to watch horror. You know, more I want to watch sci-fi even. And this, for me, is just a funner watch. Now, it's not as artsy. Um, it's probably not quite as creative, but it really is just a very well done, you know, three-act structure film with a lot of good little gory bits. Um, nothing that will make you gag or anything like that. Just a little blood splatter and such. Um, this film is just, to me, funner. Uh... And that's, as a movie reviewer, this is all preference, you know? Just because I say it, it is not the end-all, be-all. You know, it doesn't matter if, if you're a guy who has two subscribers or a guy who has a million. It's still just an opinion. And as far as, like, rewatchability, I would probably go back to two. And now... I don't think that's nostalgia, because like I said, this film was on a lot when I was a teen, but it was always in the background of other things, you know? So I don't have this, like, golden-eyed memory of, oh, remember Mimic 2? <gasps> I don't have that. But as far as, hey, I had a good time, that was a fun film, Mimic 2, for me, is better of an experience than Mimic 1. I'm sorry. I'm goddamn sorry, not sorry, you know? Uh, so, my overall thoughts here are even though the first one has probably more soul, this has more entertainment. And when I turn on a film, that is important. I want to be entertained. So, I'm going to be fair here, because I wouldn't give it something above Mimic 1, because again, it, uh, Mimic 1 has the Artur soul, it's Guillermo, even early Guillermo deserves its respects. Uh, but I'm not going to put it under, because I prefer watching this one over the first one. So, I will give it the same rating, because just as Mimic 1 uh, needs to be respected as a little Guillermo gem, this one needs to be respected as pure entertainment because both are important. So, three and a half tiny top hats out of five. Mimic two, the captain prefers. Mimic three from 2003. This little piace takes a different turn for the Mimic series, because up to this point, it has been mainly, ah, spooky monsters scare me. Right? Uh, this film, while I don't know if it had the budget to pull everything off, it is ballsy as hell, because it takes more of a rear window approach, more of the Alfred Hitchcock thing. And uh, I think for the most part, it works. It, th this film is smaller scale than the first two. And the kind of mm, slower pace, I guess you'd call it. The pacing is much more of a good thriller, uh, a truly good horror, if you will. Um, this is the slow burn. And for those of you who know my... Um, preferences well, I'd much rather take a slow burn thriller over a big budget, ah, blow up the monster, you know? I'd rather take the quiet, the eerie, 
The slow build. Something that can get under your skin. Eh, I guess in this series, uh, literally and figuratively. <laughs> now we're still in New York, and it has been, again, another passage of years. Um, and if you recall from the first film, all this bullshit started from something called Strickler's disease, which was being carried from cockroaches to children. Well, as you know, the Judas breed was made, and it did wipe out the cockroaches, which did, you know, in turn, save the kids of New York City. And uh, one of these kids who survived a little bit older now, you know, certainly a young man now, uh, is named Marvin. And uh, he lives with his mom and his sister in this uh, little, you know, high-rise apartment. And he has been very much uh, destroyed. You know, he lived, but his life has been destroyed from Strickler's disease because now he has an autoimmune deficiency. And he can really only live, like, in his room, not even really outside of his room in the other parts of the apartment, really just his room. It has to be very sterile and... You know, he's become the old term bubble boy, you know. Um, and he's picked up this hobby by living vicariously, where he's got binoculars and he just kind of watches the apartment next to him and, you know, kind of sees people more as characters. And, oh, there's old lady O'Malley and her kooky shenanigans. And, oh, look, there's our local drug dealer. And, oh, he's meeting lady o o O'Malley and she's, she's getting her weed. <laughs> he just observes people, not, not in like a creepy pervert way, you know? Like he's not peering into windows for stimulation. Uh, <laughs> he's really watching people because they have lives and it's something he can't really have because his body betrays him. And he's made uh, a hobby going even further into this of taking pictures, you know, with the long lens and whatnot. And, you know, he makes little scrapbook uh, kind of scenario, but it's on his wall, you know. Going a little far, maybe, but still, this kid's just living vicariously. One thing leads to another, and he sees uh, his little sister's more or less boyfriend uh, murdered in the alley across the street. It's late, he's not sure what he saw, but it almost appears as some type of gentleman in a dark hat and a dark overcoat a strange bug man has killed someone in the alley across. So he calls the cops, and, you know, again, there's a bit of a mystery. Of course, not really for us, the viewer. We know what it is, you know. Uh, obviously, it's, again, you know, must be the last. Uh, so we think um, fully formed adult Judas Breed. Now, I really have to give a shout-out here to Alexis Desenay as Rosie, uh, Marvin's sister, and Carl Geary as Marvin. Their relationship, their chemistry, made me genuinely invested. And this is, this is Mimic 3, fuckers. Oh, oh, Mimic 3 Sentinel. And I actually <laughs> give a shit about our leads, because they're charming kids, you know? Um, they had quickly became, within the first few minutes of their screen time, my favorite leads out of all three of the Mimic series. You know, I did not go into this thinking that there would be some elements that get better. When Guillermo del Toro is the bar, you don't expect things to go up from there. Uh, but as far as characters go, uh, Rosie and Marvin knock it out of the park. I enjoy their dialogue and the scenes that they're in. 
Actually, while we're on cast, I did not expect to see veteran Amanda Plummer. Always a treat. Uh, she always kind of lights up any scene she's in. Nor did I expect Lance Hendrickson uh, to be in this. Who, I mean, come on, Lance, Lance, smoky voice, Lance, are you fucking kidding me? I'm only saddened that the last time I saw Lance Hendrickson was in this shitty little film I reviewed for my eternal punishment, Strange Brew Reviews, a film called Why. And that, that really, <laughs> that title said it all. It's like they knew they were making garbage, folks. But <clears throat> poor Lance shows up in that film for like five minutes sitting at a desk. And you can tell it's like, well, we had enough money for five minutes with Lance, so we took it. Okay, now the rest of the film. <laughs> so it was good to see him in something. Why? Why, it's not a huge part. Um, it's maybe a little more than a cameo, so just a smaller role. It was great to see Lance, and, uh, again, small role, but equally charming, Amanda Plummer. Now, Mimic 3 Sentinel takes heavy, heavy inspiration from Rear Window by Alfred, Alfred, leave it in, don't edit it, don't edit it out, fucker. <laughs> Leave it in so everyone can laugh and you can cry and you will dance and I will die. <laughs> A little dramatic, aren't I, folks? A little dramatic. Um, I don't even remember what the fuck I was saying now. I'm all shook up. I'm ADHD. I can only stay with a focus for so long, and apparently it's a little under an hour, and then derail. De fucking rail. <laughs> Heavy inspiration from Alfred Hitchcock, and this film has no shame in that. Like, it really takes the rear window plot and says, let's add a giant bug monster. Yeah. You know? Uh, I don't feel that it's quite a ripoff, though. Because, I mean, you know, uh, this director is no Hitchcock. He's not going to have certain nuances and the mastery. But, 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 Jessica Alba has a nice rear. And what they did with this film is so ballsy. And like I said prior, it almost works where you really have to admire it. Yeah. <laughs> This is Mimic 3. Uh, probably straight to video. Maybe theatrical. My guess is it was straight to video. They could have really just uh, phoned it in. They could have just said, Oh, but big bug monsters uh, startle the shit out of me. Here's some blood. All right. End credits. You go home, you got what you fucking paid for. But they didn't do that. They actually tried. They tried to make something with uh, a little more to it than just a ah, big scary monster bug thing. You know? They did, they truly tried. And I do think that like 70, 80% of this works. I think it all works until it doesn't. Um, really... The biggest problem I have is the ending. Just like the last 10, 15 minutes, it's like, ah, they were driving you on your fucking flight. You know, you've only got two hours and a half. You're on first class. The, the, the stewardess, Sydney, just walked up to you and she winked at you a couple times, made you feel special. You've got a cranberry cocktail, maybe a little dash of apple in your hands. You're eating steak. Yeah, they're plastic forks, but it takes a little more to cut, but you're eating steak on first class. Sydney's being fucking fantastic. You got your, your headrest. Ah, nice on your neck. Are we going to land this bitch and... <laughs> A lot of whew. 
Unfortunately, the film does not land the ending. Not for me. It's nothing that destroys it completely, though I did just compare it to a crash. Uh, but it could have been great. This is a film that is really, really good until it's not. Now, it does probably have some of the more brutal kills in the series. And for a veteran horror fan, that really works for me. It also is shot real nice. Not del Toro nice, but nice. Um, the acting is good. I love our leads. I mean, again, every time they're on screen, I found myself gravitating towards them. You know, their likability. Um, Lance is phenomenal. Always a class act. Uh, everything pretty much works. Ooh, I should mention... I should mention, there is a kill in this one that comes out of nowhere and it involving a parent. I probably gave it away, but that's okay. Involving a parent where I actually found myself muttering under my breath and whatnot. Fuck. Great kill. Best of the series. CGI. In all of these series, I don't think I've mentioned this yet, but there are there is some early 2000s, early 90s CGI in these films. All of it bad. All of it bad. You know, sometimes when it's in the dark, it's okay, but seriously, for the most part, all the CGI in the Mimic series is shit. This film was very conflicting because... I think I was the most invested in this one than even the prior two. But I think both of the last entries had much better conclusions than this one. Um, and, you know, it's just, a, again, preferential. You know, my preference. You might watch it and be like, oh, the ending's fine, Patrick. You're being a nitpicky fuck. Well, I have to be, baby doll. I'm the movie reviewer. Kind of my job. The ending does not land. It kind of crashes and fizzles out. But if you were to say to me, Patricia, which out of the mimic films would you be quickest to revisit? Well, ladies unt gentlemen and anything else squirming out in the dark, I would have to say... Mimic 3. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I know there are folks out there who'd be like, your taste is trash, and be, I'd be like, no, baby doll, my life is trash. <laughs> Mimic 3. Uh, is much less of an ooey-gooey bug movie and more of a slow burn horror thriller. And for me, that's just more entertaining. That's different. Uh, I don't want to fucking throw up when I watch it, but at the same time, I can see some really cool gory kills. Now, as far as artfulness, hmm, definitely one, maybe even two. But three, three has the best story. And I don't know. I love spectacle. I, Christ, look at me. I love spectacle. But if you can give me a good story, something I can sink my little jagged teeth into, that's what I'm going to gravitate towards. So why I don't think this film is... Mimic 3 is not as well made as the first two, but it's more enjoyable for a seasoned horror fan like me. So, I can't, because it is just a low-budget straight-to-DVD flick, I can't give it a four or five. That's, mm, you know what I mean? That's just pushing it. You know? The artist in me will not allow it. But I'm not going to put it under... Uh, the first two, because I enjoyed this one more than the first two. So you know what we got, folks? We got a 
menage a of sorts because mimic one, mimic two, mimic three, sentinel. All the mimic series, we're gonna give them a resounding three and a half tiny top hats out of five. I have truly, truly enjoyed watching this little series. You can watch all three on HBO. They literally have the Mimic Collection right now on HBO Max. Totally worth paying for, by the way, folks. Um, a lot of great stuff, including every single fucking thing of Batman is also on HBO. Um, no. The Last of Us is, is fucking phenomenal. Been enjoying that. Just about to watch the last episode. Ready to cry and such. I've enjoyed this. This was a fun little niche franchise. It's very under the radar, you know. Everybody talks about, like, Alien and Predator. Um, I, I would dare say uh, even Species is probably more known as a series than Mimic. You know, just three movies. Much like Candyman, you know. You get your beginning, your middle, your end, and you're out. And I, I can truly say this is a series I will revisit at some point, and with mostly fondness. Yeah, I don't like the gross stuff, but you know what? Monsters, you, you gotta kind of accept it. If you're into monsters, you're gonna see gross stuff at some point. <laughs> you know? Um, but I, I enjoyed this. I'm glad I was able to watch films that all uh, entertained me in different ways. And uh, I can't wait to talk about more series and uh, more movies with y'all fine-ass looking folks. Mm, look at you. Mm. I have been your host, Patrick Ferguson, the infamous and penniless The Captain. Nighty-night, folks. Don't let the Judas breed bite. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for tuning in to another episode of the Captain's Cast. Remember to stay tuned up for another episode of Strange Brew Reviews, as well as Clock Tower Quickies, The Captain Covers, Clock Tower Eats, and other bullshit that the Captain has playlists for. This has been Mark, representing the Clock Tower Gentleman, now, fuck off! <laughs>